الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وسيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حق وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا استنابه Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're delving into the story and the life of our beloved Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. And in particular, we're going to focus on an incident that took place in which Yusuf alayhi salam was not only tried, but in which we find lessons for ourselves. When we are faced with trials, how do we react? More importantly, how do we prepare ourselves for those trials? Because oftentimes when we think about the trials of Yusuf alayhi salam or the trials of any of the prophets alayhi salatu wasalam, even the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we think that when they were tested, they just had some magical ability to make it through that test. And the reality is that these were number one human beings but on top of that, these were the chosen human beings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they had certain traits and certain characteristics and they used their lives and they spent their lives in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they were tried, when they faced difficult moments in their life, they were prepared to face those trials. And so the issue that I want to address today in this short time that I have is how do we prepare ourselves? How do we make sure that when we are tried, that we are ready? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave us an example of this. He said, Inna He said, true patience or perseverance is at the onset of a calamity. Meaning later, when the calamity is gone, a person can look back and say, you know what, I should have done this and I should have done that. Or you know what, I made this mistake and I wasn't ready and, and now I'm going to be more patient and whatever it may be. And sometimes we actually put on glasses, rose-colored glasses, and we look back at times where we were tested and tried and we're like, yeah, I think I did pretty well. Because we look back and everything seems much better. But the true test of our perseverance, of our patience, of our taqwa, of our iman, of our God consciousness, of our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is how we reacted in that moment. So let's take a look at that moment in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. When Yusuf alayhi salam was brought to the house of the chief minister al-Aziz as a young boy, and he was given residence there, he was also tried. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا that when he reached the maturity of age, when he got older, when he was mature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him two characteristics, hukman wa ilma, wisdom and knowledge. So now there's a trial that he's about to go through. And what are the tools that he has at his disposal? He has wisdom and he has knowledge. Knowledge we know is imperative, is important, is critical. Because knowledge is what gives us the information of what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is displeasing to Allah jalla wa ala. It is through knowledge we learn how to be obedient to Allah. It is through knowledge that we learn how to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء That it is only and only the ulama. Those, I'm not talking about titles. I'm talking about people who have knowledge, al-ulama, those who have knowledge, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only those who have knowledge that have true khashya of Allah, that can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ When Allah wants good for a person, Allah grants them an understanding of the religion. But my brothers and sisters, it's not our definition or understanding of knowledge. Because in our current climate and culture, we think knowledge 
is just a collection of information. I read a lot of books, or excuse me, we're in 2024. I read a lot of websites. I spent a lot of time on Wikipedia. I saw a lot of YouTube videos, and now we're devolving into, I watched a lot of TikToks on this subject, so I know what I'm talking about. Right? I followed so-and-so influencer on TikTok, so I know this subject inside out. But علم, my brothers and sisters, is not just a collection of information, because information, without it penetrating our heart, without sincerity, without us acting upon it, without us living information, that information not only becomes useless, that information can become a witness and a proof against us. Regarding the Qur'an, the Prophet ﷺ said, The Qur'an is either a witness or a proof for you, or, is it a, or it is a witness against you. Meaning there are people who are going to come on the Day of Judgment thinking they were Ahlul Qur'an, they were people of the Qur'an because perhaps they had memorized the Qur'an. Perhaps they had recited the Qur'an. But if they did not act upon the Qur'an, if they did not live their life by the Qur'an, if they weren't guided by the Qur'an, then the Qur'an now becomes a witness against them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So the knowledge of the prophets was not just information. This was lived knowledge. This was knowledge acted upon. And the proof for that is in the wisdom that was granted to the prophets. Because wisdom, to put simply, means where does this knowledge apply? Is this knowledge fitting this time and this place and this condition, this circumstance I'm in right now or not? Because we have a lot of people out there who once again have knowledge. They have information. And we know what that leads to sometimes. Putting that information down wherever they see fit as opposed to having wisdom, where you understand and you know that this knowledge applies in this situation and this circumstance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam knowledge and wisdom. But why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ نَجِزِ muhsinin." This is how we reward those who do good. And this teaches us that good knowledge, beneficial knowledge, knowledge that we have acted upon is granted to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that only comes when we live our lives with ihsan. Ihsan is as defined by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah, that you worship Allah as if you see Allah. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ that even though you don't see Allah, you know that Allah sees you. That is ihsan. To live your life in consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being aware of what is pleasing to Allah. Knowing that Allah is watching me at all moments, at all times. When you live your life in that way, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you knowledge and wisdom. Because once again, knowledge can be sought for many reasons. Knowledge in our days can be sought to be popular, to have a lot of followers online, to be TikTok famous. I had a brother come up to me once and he said, do you know me? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't know you. He said, you probably don't know me because I'm TikTok famous. I'm like, what? Kharas, TikTok famous, right? That's a thing now. But knowledge can be sought for many reasons. And actually, this is something the Prophet said, even warned us about. That a person who seeks knowledge for the wrong intention, actually that leads them to the hellfire. That there are those who, as the Prophet ﷺ informed us, those who seek knowledge, لِيَصْرِفَ وُجُوهَ nas ilay, To turn the faces of people towards themselves. That is a type of intention that leads a person to the hellfire. The Prophet ﷺ said that a person may seek knowledge to argue with the foolish, to show I'm better than you. I know what I'm talking about. I can defeat you in a debate. I can defeat you in an argument. My reaction to your video right here, and I destroyed you, right? Based, as they say nowadays. <laughs> For that reason, another reason, the Prophet ﷺ said, to boast amongst the scholars, to have that status. A person wants to be known as a scholar, as an alim, as a person of knowledge, so that is their intention. 
And the Prophet ﷺ told us that these intentions leads a person to the hellfire. Knowledge has to be sought for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowledge has to be sought because we want Jannah and we know that it is through knowledge that we attain Jannah. Fa'lam, Allah says, no, have a surety, learn, no, fa'lam, annahu la ilaha illallah. Have deep knowledge that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we do that ihsan, then we gain the reward of knowledge and wisdom. It is in this circumstance that Yusuf alayhi salam found himself being tried. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, The wife of the chief minister, Al-Aziz, he lived in her house and that is where she tried to seduce him. In the house that he was granted refuge in. What happened here? What was the situation? Well, she didn't just try to seduce him in public or in front of someone. She made sure that all the bases were covered. And what indicates to that is the way she closed the doors. And, the, and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, the word غَلَّقَتِ abwab, this gives a couple different meanings. Number one, the doors were closed and locked with force. Meaning she made sure the doors were locked. Also, some of our scholars mention that there is no chance that someone could invade their privacy or come in to this room because there were multiple rooms that were locked. A room in another room in another room so multiple doors had, would have to be unlocked for them to be disturbed. After making sure that no human being would know, no human being would have access to what she wants to do, she said, hey, talak. She said, come to me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how Yusuf alayhi salam replied. Qala ma'ad Allah. He said, Allah is my refuge. I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again. Why did this happen? Better yet, how did this happen? This happened because Yusuf alayhi salam was prepared for this. Maybe not directly. But by the way he lived his life, Yusuf alayhi salam was prepared. And we see this in the rest of this verse and verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, He says, Ma'ad Allah, Allah is my refuge. I seek refuge in Allah. Allah will protect me. Protect me. And really, this is in two ways. Number one, protect me from the consequences of what will, the consequences of me refusing this temptation. Because the wife of Al-Aziz, she was in a position of power. She had control over the situation. And Yusuf alayhi salam knew that there are going to be some dunya, some worldly consequences for him refusing this offer. So he sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. And also on a second level, he sought refuge in this temptation. Because as we will see, this is not a temptation that Yusuf alayhi salam had no desire for. And some people are uneasy with this concept that Yusuf alayhi salam, it is not only that she desired Yusuf alayhi salam, but Yusuf alayhi salam would be inclined towards her as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا That she was, she was inclined towards him. She was determined to seduce him and he would be inclined towards her لَوْلَ أَنْ رَأَى بُرْهَانَ رَبِّي If he had not seen the sign of his Lord. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, inshallah ta'ala. But he said, Ma'ad Allah, I seek refuge in Allah. Allah will protect me. He knew that if it's a moment where I'm being tested and tried, I turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innahu Rabbi ahsana mathwai. He said, it is, it is not right for me to betray my master who has given me a good place to stay, who has taken good care of me. And the first meaning of this is Al Aziz, the chief minister. He is saying this would be a betrayal of that trust. He housed me in his house. And for me to be involved in an intimate way with his wife would be a betrayal of that trust. The second and overlying meaning of this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the best, that the best uh, one who takes care of me is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Lord. That whatever I could gain in this moment, if he had given in to this offer, perhaps he wouldn't have been jailed. Perhaps he could have remained living in that house. But the best refuge, the best house, the best abode 
is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is always Allah who has taken care of him in his whole life. So how can he abandon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And we ask ourselves every moment in our life, who has taken care of us? Who is the one who has provided for us? Who is the one who we can turn to in the darkness of the night and pour our heart out to? It is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, he says, Innahu la yuflihu al-zalimoon. That the wrongdoers, the oppressors, the transgressors will never be victorious. And this, my brothers and sisters, is part of our aqidah. It is part of our creed. It is part of our belief system as Muslims. We live by this statement that the one who commits zulm will never be successful in the long run. Perhaps in the moment, this person may be successful. Perhaps in the moment, they get away with their crime and their transgression and their oppression. Perhaps. But in the long run, they will never be successful. This aqidah is the same aqidah of our brothers and sisters in Gaza right now. They know that whatever crimes are committed against them, no matter what has been, no matter what atrocities are committed against them, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ That the oppressors, the transgressors, the wrongdoers will never truly be successful. Success comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe they get away with it in this life. Maybe. But in the long run, dhulm will never be overlooked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about those who commit crimes in this life. And when we see them getting away with these crimes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلَ عَمَّ يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ Do not think Allah is unaware of the crimes of the oppressors and wrongdoers. Don't think Allah is unaware. إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَسُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ He is only delaying them until a day when they will stare in horror. This is our aqidah, my brothers and sisters. ظلم will be ظلمات يوم القيامة. ظلم will be layers upon layers of darkness on the day of judgment. This is why when we see ظلم occurring to others, we recognize this. We never lose hope because we know the more dhulm that is committed, the more harsh and more severe the punishment will be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't punish anyone unjustly. No one will come on that day of judgment and say, Oh Allah, you are being unjust towards me. I don't deserve this punishment. Do you know why? Because even if no one else testifies to the crimes that were committed, Let's say no one witnessed a crime. Someone commits a crime, they oppress someone, they wrong someone, and there's no witnesses. Their own bodies will testify. Allah says today we will seal their mouths. Be quiet. You were speaking in this life and you were lying and lying and lying, but today you remain silent. Their own hands, their own hands will speak to their crimes. And their own legs and their feet will testify to the crimes that they have committed. This is why a believer, my brothers and sisters, never ever lose, loses hope. A believer understands the power and the might and the anger and the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we see our children suffering in Gaza, when we see limbs blown off, we never lose hope. We understand, Allah is only delaying them until a day where their punishment will be more severe. This is a zulm that we need to understand on a larger level and even on a personal level. Because when we commit sins and when we transgress, this is a form of zulm, my brothers and sisters. There's many levels and forms of dhulm. There's dhulm that we commit upon others, which we just spoke about. But there's also dhulm that we do to ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهِ The one who crosses the boundaries of Allah. Allah has set limits for us. Allah has set boundaries for us. Allah has made certain things halal and certain things haram. The one who crosses those boundaries, فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهِ they had only done dhulm to themselves. They had only wronged themselves. You know, Iblis, the shaitan, will come on the day of judgment 
and he will actually remind us of this very issue. When he is standing in front of the people who are being taken to the hellfire, and Iblis now delivers a sermon to the people of the hellfire, they're hoping that he's going to provide some answers. But you know what Iblis the shaitan says to the people of the hellfire? He says, فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't blame me, blame yourselves. مَا أَنَا بِمُسْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِخِي You cannot help me and I cannot help you. I reject all the associations you made with me in your life. Meaning in this life, there are those who listen to the shaitan, obeyed the shaitan instead of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an association. Instead of being obedient to Allah, a person is obedient to the shaitan. So the shaitan says, I have nothing to do with that. I take no responsibility for that. And then he says, Inna الظالمين لهم عذاب أليم The ظالمين, the wrongdoers, the transgressors, the oppressors, they have a painful punishment awaiting them. His message to the people is that this happened because of your dhulm. So my brothers and sisters, here Yusuf alayhi salam is reminding himself and reminding us and this message is in the Qur'an for us to take heed. إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ That the ظَالِمُونَ will never ever be victorious. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْ أَنْ رَآ بُرْهَانَ رَبِّي That she was determined to seduce him. And he would have been inclined towards her had he not seen the proof of his Lord. What is this proof? This proof is the iman in his heart. This proof is his prophethood. This proof is the fact that Allah had made him a messenger. This proof is his Islam. And this is the same proof that we carry in our hearts. Every single believer in their heart, they carry this proof of iman. The proof of the prophethood of the prophets, the proof of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that is the tool that we have, that when we are tempted and we are tried and we're going through difficult situations, we have that burhan. We have that proof in our hearts. And then Allah says, كَذَلِكَ لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ السُّوءَ وَالْفَحْشَاءَ This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is how we kept evil and indecency away from him. إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَصِينَ He was certainly from our chosen servants. My brothers and sisters, in this moment, the truthfulness of his submission came to light. Every time we are tested, it is a moment for us to prove our iman, to prove our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know what you all are thinking right now. That was one moment. That was one seduction. That was one temptation. We live in a time now where in a single day, a person may be tempted many times. You turn on the TV, there's trials, there's temptations, there's fitna. You open your phone, you scroll, doom scroll, right? Scroll till no end and you come across things and this is a trial. Every day, how are we supposed to succeed? I wanna share with you real quickly an example of another person that succeeded. And that is the hadith of the seven people who were granted shade by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day in which there is only shade provided by Allah. Seven people, the Prophet said, will be shaded on the day in which there is the only shade is the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are these people? Imam Adil, a just leader. Shabun, Nasha'abi ibadatillah, a young person who has raised, lived their life in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rajulun, كان قلبه معلقا بالمساجد. A person whose heart was attached to the masjid. Two people who love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. اجتمع عليه وتفرق عليه. They come together for the sake of Allah and they depart for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ورجل ذكر الله خاليا ففاضت عيناه. A person who remembers Allah in privacy. And because of that, their eyes, they swell with tears. وَرَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِمَالٍ A person who gives charity in privacy, such secrecy, such privacy that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is spent. And then the last category, or one of the seven categories, is رَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ ذَاتَ حَسَبٍ A man who is invited by a woman of status and beauty. 
فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافَ الله. And he said, I fear Allah. Very similar to the statement of Yusuf alayhi salam. Now here's the kicker. All of these categories are a lifetime. A just leader, a just ruler, that's a lifetime. A young person who was raised in the worship of Allah, that's a lifetime of worship. A person who loves their brothers and sisters for the sake of Allah, that's a, all of these categories are a lifetime. But there's one category which is just a moment. The person who was invited by a woman, who was tempted by a woman, is just a moment. How are they equivalent? They are equivalent because once again, as I said in the beginning of my talk, the success does not come just from that moment. The success comes from preparing yourself for that moment. When you live your life in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are preparing yourself to protect yourself in that moment when you are tested and tried. We don't wait until the test or the trial to say, can I succeed or not? We prepare ourselves. So when we are tempted, whether it be through our phones or TV or what we're accessing online, whatever it may be, do we say, ma'ad Allah? Do we say, I fear Allah? Allah is my refuge. Because that is the only thing that can protect us. And I know today, I talk to a lot of parents, and parents say, this is the most difficult time in, in history. We have never faced a trial like this. Our children are facing tests and trials that they've never been through before. And I'm like, look, I agree with you, but every generation says that. Every generation says, this is the worst generation. Right? Is, uh, we, this is terrible. It's never been this bad. But people succeed. They succeed because they have their iman. They have their taqwa. They have God consciousness. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to recognize goodness as goodness and the ability to follow it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to recognize evil as evil and the ability to abstain and stay away from it. Hada wallahu ta'ala a'lam subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa tubu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.